think of the 90s it started this phrase that we talked about over and over in the churches the spirit filled life I mean, it was mentioned before, but it seemed like there was a, a craze that went on in the churches about that time, and the Pentecostal churches really got it moving, but it started spreading, and we talked so much about it. There was so much discussion at this point in the church today that the matter has become a matter of confusion, so much so that it's almost like we've thrown enough, enough sand in the sky that now we can't see what we're really even talking about that today I thought we'd start discussing, because Romans does, what life in the Spirit and what a Spirit-filled life really looks like. Because Paul wants to talk to that, talk about that with us. He wants to describe that to us. He wants us to understand exactly what that means. He wants to talk about life in the Spirit. And we're going to do this in two parts. We're going to talk about it this week, and then we're going to have a break next week, because next week is Mother's Day, and... We want to talk about moms a little bit. And then after Mother's Day, we'll wrap this up. So we're going to have a week, which will give you some time to think about it, take a break, then come back to it and wrap things up. But when we talk about life in the Spirit, we're talking about people who are followers of Jesus. Now, the follower of Jesus no longer is a person who is dead in their sins. Amen? It is a person who is brought to life through Jesus. This is good news for us. Now, as much as I can, I'm going to try and stand and, and preach. We'll see how that goes. It went pretty well last week, so hopefully it goes well again this week. But I got my trusty stool here just in case. And a, a new way of life is introduced. Now, this new way of life is an exciting thing because with this new way of life, power to live the way God desires has been given. But Paul explains that the believer must do two things. They must be in the process of doing two different things. The first thing that the believer must be in the process of doing is getting rid of things from their life. Removing things. But it's not just removing things, is it? I mean, that's what it sounded like. I remember in a church that I was in for a little while, it was just a list, right? We don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do this, and we don't associate with people who do. And that's what the Christian life looked like. But that's not the Christian life according to the Bible. It's not just a list of what we don't do, is it? You see, because the Christian life doesn't just get rid of things. The Christian life is also about adding to, putting on. Paul describes it, put off this and put on this. So we get rid of things, and we add things to our lives. We replace what we get rid of. That's good news. Now, if this is what we're doing, turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 8, because now we're going to take a look at what Paul is describing about this life in the Spirit. And what he's going to do, he's going to compare and contrast two different kinds of life. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse... For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God, because it does not submit itself to God's laws, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father God, we come to you now. We just want to ask that you would guide, that you would speak to us, that you would reveal your truth to our hearts, that you would apply your truth to our lives, that you would challenge us, that you would help us during this time, Lord, to be able to focus on you, God. This world 
in our minds and our own our own selves so often we're distracted we distract ourselves we we focus on other things and God I just ask that right now that you would help us be able to focus on what you have to say that we would hear what you are saying I pray that you would you would hide me and that it would be you who is talking to us that the words that are mine would disappear and the words that are yours would become very very clear and I pray that in Jesus name amen so Paul begins by saying that we should not be walking according to the flesh. That seems pretty easy to understand. There's a reason for that, because it is the way of death. Sin kills us, right? Now, the truth is, Paul wants us to understand that all humanity basically can be divi divided, not just basically, all, humani all humanity is divided into two categories. Two very specific categories. Those who are of the flesh, that is, those who are controlled by their old sinful nature. That is what they have. They are of the flesh. Their sinful nature, they're who, that's who they are. They were born with it. That's what they are driven by. The flesh drives them. Makes sense, right? That's how we're born. The flesh drives us. Unless something changes, that's what we're driven by, right? Our natural desires. Something has to change. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 7 when he realizes that's the situation. But then there are these other people. Those who are of the Spirit, new creatures in Christ. These are the two different groups of people. There is, by the way, no third category. That is, those who are justified but are just putting off having Jesus as master, of his, as, as master of their lives. Paul doesn't talk about that group. There is no that group in the Bible. Paul doesn't mention them. There, there isn't the, that kind of people. This is not a biblical category. It doesn't exist. You are either of the flesh or of the spirit. Now, Paul contrasts these two things, these two groups. He, he contrasts their mindset how they think. He contrasts their attitude towards God. He contrasts their spiritual capacity. He contrasts their final end. Now, Romans 5, 8, sorry, Romans 8, 5 through 8 gives us the beginning of that picture. We're going to look back at that picture again one more time because we want to really get this in our heads. Look at these th first three verses of our passage again. For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, about the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul begins by saying those of the flesh live for the flesh. Now here's the overview. Those of the flesh live for the flesh. Their minds are set on fleshy things. They are hostile towards God and his law. Pure and simple. We may want to say that's not true, but that's what the Bible says. They are unable to obey or please God. Just simply unable. It's not a possibility. And the mindset of the flesh leads towards death. Now this is the overarching picture. It's not a great picture, is it? It's not a happy picture. So let's, let's break it down just a little bit. Their minds are set on fleshy things. John talks about this to believers. He, he talks to us about this, and he, he's concerned for us. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Turn to your Bibles there, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. By the way, before you go about thinking that I think somebody going out in outer space is a fleshy thing, and that's so that anybody that goes in outer space is fleshy, or somebody that plays keyboard is fleshy. That's not the idea of that picture back there. But that their focus is not on pleasing God, 
but on just the thing itself. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things that belong to the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For everything that belongs to the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lusts is passing away. But the one who does God's will remains forever. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. Everything that belongs to the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride in one's lifestyle, the pride of life. You know, that's a dangerous situation, isn't it? It's a difficult thing, and it's easy for Christians to fall back into those things, to get trapped by those things, to get pulled back into that. Because it's tempting, isn't it? I mean, the world is constantly tempting us, teasing us, calling us back to these things. And if we are not focused on our God, if we are not focused on Him, that attention easily steers away. This is why, by the way, John is warning Christians about this very thing. But the fleshy person, those whose minds are, those who are of the flesh, their minds are set on these things. Their minds are focused on these things. Their ambition is towards these things. You see, they, they are set directly towards it. Their aim is towards it, maybe in different ways, maybe in different directions. That's why every, every unbeliever is focused in a slightly different angle, different way. One person is all about pleasure, hedonism. Another person is all about ambition and drive to be the best, be at the top. But every person's drive is aimed towards fleshy things that is an unbeliever. Now, here's the reality. According to Scripture, what you think reflects who you are and determines what you do. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, 23 with me. And I hope you brought your Bibles because we're going to be looking at some Scripture today. Just in case you didn't. Because you should have. Proverbs 4, 23. We read these words. Guard your heart. Above all else, for it is the source of life. You see, from here, it, it, it reveals where I am. It, it shows, it demonstrates where I am. I'm not going to pursue things that aren't already driven from in, in here. Right? So I have to call it, I have to protect, I have to not let things get in here and be my driving motivation, because if it is, it's too late. This is why God is supposed to be the center, it's supposed to be the focus as a Christian, Right? So what happens for a Christian when God gets like two hours of my week? Who's my focus, really? Is he God at that point? Is he God of my life? If he gets two hours out of seven days of my life, is he really God? Can we honestly say that? Those, who are, those whose minds are set on fleshly things are attracted to, to the deeds of the flesh. Look at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Oh, hey, Jeremy, can I get a little help there? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Thank you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. And we see this. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I tell you about these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, when our minds are set on things of the flesh, they, start being they are attracted to doing things of the flesh. Makes sense, right? No surprise. But those who are of the flesh, 
their minds are set on these things and their thoughts are absorbed with fleshy things. Look at Philippians chapter 3, 19. Philippians chapter 3, 19. And it says this, their, e their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. They are forever, they are focused, they are focused, this by the way, enemies of the cross of Christ, according to verse 18, they are focused on earthly things. And then he makes a contrast in the next verse, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a contrast there being made, again, with those two different groups. You are either focused on earthly things, focused after those things, pursuing those things, or you are eagerly waiting for Jesus, looking for him, longing for him, pursuing after him. Our churches look a lot like the world lately, don't they? Now, I'm not talking about the worship service even. I'm not talking about the gathering. I'm talking about the real churches, the people. That's what church is, right? We all understand that the church is the people that gather. Our churches look a lot like the world. We're going after all these other things. What we, who we are, what we go after, what we're attracted to, what we're absorbed with, what our thoughts are on. You know, you can't study a passage like this and not be challenged in your own life. And God certainly challenges me, calling me more and more saying, okay, Tom, examine yourself a little deeper. And even this morning saying, what else do you need to get rid of? What else do you need to remove? What else do you want? How much more can you be mine? How much more can you be committed than you already are? That's a good question for us that are already his, right? How much of the world have we allowed to seep into our lives, church? But this does not mean, and please understand, church, those who are of the flesh, and this is where we get run into danger, right? We look at these three things and we say, man, you get an unbeliever in this church, you'll be able to tell. They are going to be wicked with a capital W, right? Evil. Come on. We know that's not true. It doesn't mean that every person who is of the flesh is all wicked and super criminal in the earthly sense. Many are good and, and, and moral people, right? They're upstanding citizens. We understand that, don't we? But understand this. What Scripture reveals is what is often hidden to us. You see, the reality is, the truth is, the unbeliever, those who are of the flesh, who have yet to turn to Christ, who have not turned to Christ, are hostile towards God and His laws. They may not overtly be, it may not be an obvious thing, they may even be for the law, they may be for truth, they may be, well, they may be upholders of the law, right? But that doesn't mean they're his. That doesn't mean they stand for him. Because the reality is, Scripture explains the real situation. Because those who are of the flesh are hostile towards God and his laws. Romans 8, 7 says, The mindset of the flesh is hostile to him. Colossians explains it a little bit better to us about our situations. If we've already come to Christ, it explains it like this. And Colossians 1.21 says, Once you were alienated, once you were hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, and, and our ten tendency, our temptation, is to say, well, I wasn't that bad. I wasn't that wicked. I've been tempted to say that about my testimony, saying my testimony is not as good about other people as some other people's testimonies. Because you hear those testimonies, right? Those people that are were criminals. They were mob men, saved while they were in prison. 
and God rescued them from the depths of their sin. They killed people, person after person, and God rescued them, saved them, changed their lives. Dramatic conversion. It's awesome. I was saved when I was three. I'm like, what great wickedness did God save me from? This verse says, once you were alienated and hostile in your mind because of your evil actions. Period, right? It doesn't say except for you, Tom, because you were only three. You had had a chance to be wicked and evil. I was wicked and evil. True story. True story, right? End of, end of story. Christians, we have the same testimony in that regard, don't we? We who were saved were wicked and evil. Our actions were evil. What we don't all often get is that any sin against God is an act of outright rebellion against the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. And that is horrible, isn't it? You see, if, if we lie, well, we'll use Biz. If Biz lies to her sister Caroline, she, Caroline's going to be upset. Right? And she'll probably get in trouble for it. She lies to her dad. She's going to be in more trouble for it, right? Probably. If she gets in trouble with the law and has to go to court and she lies to the court. Is she going to be in more trouble or less trouble than if she were to lie to Caroline? More trouble, right? Because of who she's lying to? Right? It's, it's a matter of who you're lying to. Now what if she, she lies to Congress because she gets called before Congress? It, it's, it has to do with who you're lying to and how big of a deal it is. So what if we're lying to Almighty God? How big of a deal is that? That's a huge deal, isn't it? See, the problem is we haven't realized how big of a deal our sin is. And so we don't look at Colossians 1.21 and say, once you were alienated and hostile in your mind because of your evil actions, because we don't realize exactly how evil our evil action is. Evil action really is, do we? It's just really, really evil. By the way, I, I don't know that Biz has a problem with lying. I just That's part of why I used her, because I'm not aware of that being an issue. Just wanted to protect your name there, Biz. <laughs> those of the flesh are hostile, right? So why do fleshy people, why do those who are of the flesh have such animosity towards God? Because the reality is, and this is it, it's not because of who they are, because they hate him personally. It's because of who and what they are. Because at their core, they are under control of sin. And folks, that's what Colossians told us, right? At our core, all of us who are his, at one point, were in that same boat. Every single one of us. So we have to make sure that we understand what we're talking about here. There's nobody that can say, well, that was never me. Because we were all in that boat. Whether we became his or whether we're currently in the boat, we were all in that boat at one point. No matter how hard we try on our own, those who are of the flesh or were of the flesh, we were motivated for our own self. We pursued our own wants, our own desires, for our own good. Even when we did good, it was for our benefit. That's why we did it. We said, no, I did good because I wanted to help somebody. But the reality is the Bible says we're selfish. And that we are all pursuing our own way. Not God's. And this simply puts us at odds, doesn't it? It puts us at, at, at a complete direct opposition to the Almighty Creator, until He rescues us from sin's domain, from its rule. Now, be careful, because once again, Christian, what we have to make sure we understand is this does not mean that they are opposed to everything that is called 
God. G-O-D. In fact, many unbelievers are what we would call religious. Right? Do you know religious unbelievers? I do. Of course. They're religious people. They do good things. They go to church. But the truth is, until something changes, as long as they are in the flesh, they are unable to please or obey God. Romans 8, 7 continues, and it goes on and says, Because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. This is one of the great texts, one of the great passages that establishes the doctrine of total depravity, simply being unable to please God. Think about that for a minute. Just not capable of doing it. There's nothing you can do in your own strength to make God happy. You can't do it. Now, the inability of the flesh is a a moral thing. This is not a physical thing. It's not like you're not capable of doing a good deed, right? You physically can do good things. But morally, you just can't be good. And this is because one isn't perfect, right? Once you've stopped being perfect, you've got a problem. The good which one does in the flesh is already marred then, right? If I use a cloth that is white and looks clean, but it's covered in invisible germs, am I making other things clean with it? Not really, am I? In fact, if I take that covered in invisible germs like listeria and, um, oh, I don't know, E. coli, which I can't see on the cloth, but it's on the cloth, and I start rubbing it all over my pans, and my silverware, although it's a white-looking cloth and it looks clean, what am I really doing? I'm spreading disease, right? I am spreading death. See, you have to understand, that's very similar to the moral unbeliever who looks good, but really has death all over them. And is headed right into that situation. They're doing good things, but their flesh is marred and and they are dead even though it looks good. It's a bad situation, isn't it? The mindset of this flesh leads them towards death because they're already dead and it just keeps dragging them closer and closer towards that end. This is what Romans 8, 6 says at the very beginning of the passage when it says, for the mindset of the flesh is death. Not leads towards death, it is death. The truth is those who are in the flesh are now currently spiritually dead. 1 Corinthians two fourteen says this, but the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. This is one of the hardest verses to deal with, isn't it? You can give a Bible to an unbeliever. How many of you have heard of Isaac Asimov? And I may have even used that illustration before. Isaac Asimov was a science fiction writer. He's passed. He was also an atheist. He wrote a commentary on the entire Bible. Read it all the way through and evaluated it. Died as an atheist. The unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's spirit because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. You see, Isaac Asimov had no desire, no longing, no no intention to understand the word of God. He makes a mockery of the entire book. When we take the word of God to people, unless God opens their eyes, they will remain blind to it, their eyes closed to it. Therefore, when we take the word of God to people, 
Christian. We need to pray that God will open their eyes, that they will understand, that it will be clear, that they will turn to him, because even the smartest person in the world will not turn to this because it is not about what they can understand and comprehend. It is about spiritually opening their eyes and their heart to the truth, and that can't happen unless God does that. Those who persist in worldliness will ultimately experience the same doom of the rest of the world. Because what happens is they reveal where they really are. They may say all the right words. They may do all the right actions. But their heart will be revealed. Now this is the situation of those who are in the flesh. What about those who are of the spirit? Those who are of the Spirit live for the Spirit, right? Here's the overview, the basic picture. Those who are of the Spirit live for the Spirit. Their minds are set on spiritual realities. They love God and His law. They are able to gladly obey and please God. Notice that, that word I use, gladly. We don't have to be sour about it. We don't have to be down about it. We don't have to, oh, i got to do God stuff again. The mindset of the Spirit leads to life and peace. That's a good thing, right? This, this is a joyful thing. You see, church, we don't want to be known as the church of the sour face, right? We want to be a happy, joyful, content, glad church. Because we have reason to be. We serve an almighty God who has brought us life, who has brought us joy. That regardless of the circumstance we face, life eternal has been brought to us. Don't get me wrong. There are some bad circumstances. And there are difficulties. But we have to focus on Him, don't we? The minds of those who are spiritual are focused on spiritual realities. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Turn your Bibles there. Colossians 3. Tells us what to do. If we are His, where our minds need to be focused. It says this. So if you have been raised with the Messiah, if you have been raised with Him, seek what is above. Where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. Have you ever heard that phrase, he is so heavenly minded, he is of no earthly good? That can't be true then, can it, according to Scripture? Our minds are supposed to be focused on what is above. And applying what is above on this earth. You see, those who are focused on spiritual realities live a different life than those who are focused on earthly realities. They are attracted to prayer. Notice that word, attracted. They are attracted. They desire prayer, worship, meeting with the church witnessing, serving, giving. Their thoughts are consumed with spiritual things. Bible study, prayer, meditation. Look at Psalm 63 and verse 1 with me. Psalm 63 and verse 1. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you. In a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. By the way, David was in the wilderness when he said that, so he knew what he was talking about. Eagerly, thirsting, fainting for God. Their mindset, the mind, those who are of the Spirit, their mindset affects their conversations with others. It impacts it, doesn't it? It should. It should have a change. It should have an impact. It should change things. It shouldn't be like, how in the world am I going to bring God into this conversation? 
Because I am so about God that I can't help but talk about the one who I am focused on. My Cincinnati Bengals yesterday drafted a guy in the fourth round from Baylor. Now, I share that. I say my Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, you can see. I'm a big fan, right? Whenever you say my about a sports team, you've realized that you're, you're like taking ownership about something that you have no ownership of. I, I recognize that. But the Cincinnati Bengals, whom I root for, drafted a guy in the fourth round. One of the things that, as much as I'm happy that they drafted him, that I was really happy about, he claims to be a Christian. He claims Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now, I'm happy that he weighs 300 and some pounds and happy that he was expected to be a first-round draft pick and that he made it to the fourth round. I like those things football-wise, but I'm also really happy that he's a Christian because I can talk about that. And that just was my automatic, like, okay, now I can talk about the draft and I don't even have to look for an opportunity. Because that's the guy I'm going to talk about, because that's the one I'm most excited about anyways now. I'm more excited about him than our first round pick, our second round pick, our third round pick, our fifth round pick, and all, so on. I'm excited about this guy, because one, he went to Baylor, uh, supposed to be a Baptist school, that, yeah, well, you know how that goes. But he claims Jesus. That's huge. That's what made me excited. I'm excited about Andy Dalton for that team because he claims Jesus. And those kind of things get me excited. Now, I'll grant you, I don't know anything about that guy's life. And that could be really messed up. I know that. I get that. But there's that opportunity. And I look for those things. I seek those things because I want God's testimony to be praised. I want him to be honored. I want him to be glorified, right? That's what we should want, shouldn't we? In everything that we're about, in everything that we do, we should want him honored. We should want him praised and glorified. Our mindset should affect our conversation easily. This doesn't mean that we are constantly living in victory, does it? Those who are of the Spirit live by the Spirit we are focused on these. Our minds are focused on these. But even John says that if we say we have no sin, we lie. And the truth is not in us. This is John when he's old, right? The apostle. John's writing this when he's older. This is John the apostle saying if we, he includes himself. John hadn't achieved it. By the way, this should do a huge blow to Christian perfection in that theology, shouldn't it? If John the Apostle at that age had not achieved perfection, I really don't think there's a person walking around this earth right now who did. That's just me. So this is the mind and what they're set on. They love God and his law. Those who belong to God, who are of the Spirit, they love God and his law. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 gives us this wonderful statement. It says, like newborn infants, desire pure spiritual milk, a reference to scripture, so that you may grow by it for your salvation. How hungry do infants get? How often do they eat? Pretty often, right? Two meals a day, right? Two meals like clockwork. No, they're, they're constantly hungry. It's like all the time. This is the comparison that we're supposed to be in regards to the hunger for God's word. Now, how do we do at that? You don't have to answer that one. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Psalm 119 and verse 97. You see, the psalmist says this. He says, The Lord is my portion. I have promised to keep your words. Now, there's something important there, right? He says, I have promised to keep your words. Now, how can he do that if he doesn't know what the words are? That's, a, that's an issue, isn't it? You see, there's a lot of Christians out there when we talk about the Bible, well, we know some basics, but when it comes to actually being able to keep God's word, how can we keep God's word if we don't know God's word? 
We are expected to be able to know it, to master it, to have it in us. I can't keep it if I don't know him, if I don't know it, if I don't understand it, if I don't grasp it, if I haven't internalized it. I have to have it in me. Now, this is what those who are of the Spirit do. They love God. They love His law. They love His Word. They are able to gladly obey and to please God. And again, that word, gladly. The mindset of the Spirit leads to life. Those who belong to Him have a good situation, don't they? There's a good picture for us. There's a good situation that we're in. Romans 8, 6 says, The mindset of the Spirit is, is, not will be, not could be, but currently is life and peace. John 10, 10 says, A thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Guys, we're not just made alive. We're expected to have life that, that is all over the place that is pouring out, that is overwhelming. That's, that's life. That's the kind of life God wants for us. That's what he desires for us. And think about this. When Jesus says that, he says that in light of the fact that he says life is going to be hard. Doesn't he? He says life is going to be hard, and yet he wants us to have an abundant life. He says life is going to be difficult, but it's going to be abundant. That's a contradiction, isn't it? In, in human terms, difficult usually doesn't mean abundance. And yet Jesus says, that's what I want for you. I'm going to give you a difficult life if you're trying to follow me. It's going to happen because the world's going to hate you because they hate me. But I've come so you have life and have it in abundance. Even more, Philippians chapter 4, 7 says, The peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is something for us. Now, it talks about what we should be thinking on, right? Before that verse, which, by the way, is pretty important. So let's turn there real quick. Philippians chapter 4 tells us what we should be doing so that that could happen, and I think that's really important. People always talk about wanting God's peace. Philippians chapter 4 tells us something that we should be doing, and if verse 8 says what we should be thinking about in light of that. Sorry, verse 8 says what we should think on. Verse 6 tells us what we need to do so that peace would be ours. And verse 6. Don't worry about every, anything. We've all got that mastered, right? Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So we start there, right? We got the things we're not supposed to worry about. We take it right to Him. And sometimes that means we take that thing to Him over and over and over again in the same day, don't we? Because that's sometimes how it has to go that day, that week, that hour. And we just keep taking it back to Him. And we pour it out. And we make that request known to God. And it says, then it says, And the peace of God which surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Church, why is it then that it seems that so many Christians live without peace? And we spend so much time worrying when we're just not listening. See, the mindset of the Spirit leads to peace and life. It is life and peace. That's the mindset. That's what it is. But we, man, it's like Romans 12, right? To be the living sacrifice. So easy to just walk right off that altar, right? Sacrifices, generally speaking, are meant to be dead and put on the altar, burned up, done. But in the church age, they're alive. <laughs> Being a living sacrifice presented to God that means you, you can walk off that altar again. I have a hard time with that. I'd much rather be once for all. That's why sometimes you hear people say, I, I'd be a martyr for God. Oh, it's so, so much easier to be a martyr, isn't it? In some respects, 
Because you die, you're done. To stay alive and keep serving and keep giving yourself and keep sacrificing and keep offering. That's what he's called us to do. If he wanted us to just die and go to heaven with him, he'd have done that. But he's called us to live for him now. That includes the worrying, giving it to him. That peace would be ours now. That life and peace would be our mindset. Because that's what the spiritual minded, the spiritual person has. It's ours. We can have it. It can be us. So how does a fleshy person, how does a fleshy person, those who are of the flesh, become a spiritual person? We've seen this huge contrast. It's a pretty big difference, isn't it? Well, a fleshy person in their own selves is unable to change their nature, aren't they? In fact, Jeremiah tells us this. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23 says, Can the Cushite change his skin or a leopard his spots? It says, If so, you might be able to do what is good. You who are instructed in evil. But the truth is that only the supernatural work of God can change you. Only the supernatural work of God. John chapter 6 and verse 44 tells us that no one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. When talking to Nicodemus, he said these words in John chapter 3, verse 6 and 7, whatever is born of the flesh is of the flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. See, he's talking and saying, look, the reality is that you were born, you were born fleshy. You were born exactly the way that Paul is talking right now, right? Of the flesh, in your flesh, pursuing sinful things. But to be spiritual, to be that different person, you have to be born of the Holy Spirit. You have to be that kind of person. That takes God doing something, doesn't it? Now there's two challenges here. Two things that we need to deal with before we can wrap things up. The first is to those who are specifically always have been at this point and to this point of their lives of the flesh. That you have not chosen to be a person who is of the Spirit. You have not given your life to Jesus. You have not said, I will follow you. Understand, I know and I get that none of my words will make a difference to you unless God does something. I get that. I also get that I am Tom Ricker. I am nothing special. But he is God. And he is amazing. And what he can do is dramatically change you. He can take who you are and make you completely different. So my challenge to you, if that's your situation, if that's where you are right now, is to say, okay, God, I've heard these words. I understand what you're saying. And if to, at this moment today, God has made you aware that this is the truth, then let's be done with everything. Let this be the day that you say, you know what, I'm not going to come up with any more excuses. I'm not going to come up with any more reasons why I'm not going to give in. And then I'm giving in to you now, God. I'm going to let you be in charge. Not because of anything Pastor Tom said, but because, God, what you've shown me, that it's you now, not me. That I'm yours now. And it's not about me, it's about you. Christian, for you, the question I have is very similar to the one God asked me. Have you let the world seep into your life? Are you focusing on it more and more? Or is God the priority? If he is not the priority, if he is not the focus, it is time to change. It is time to refocus. We have people praying in our church 
for a revival. That means there's a need for repentance, a need for change. That only happens when we're ready to say, God, I'm putting away those things that are of the world. And I'm giving that time and that effort and that my finances and my, my talents that I was giving to the world. I'm giving it to you. If you're ready to do that, to stop playing games and, and pursuing the world while calling yourself his, then I challenge you today to come forward, to make that decision, to stand before these people, not because you need to stand before them because that makes it magical, but to stand before them because it makes you accountable. And let's be honest, let's be truthful. Accountability is important, is it not? I can, I've made a lot of decisions that because there's nobody else that knows it, I can go back on it easier, can't I? But when somebody else knows it, hmm. But there's more than just that, too. What I know about people sitting here is that they will pray for you. And prayer makes a difference. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to you now. We thank you so much for the fact that you have called that you do draw people even today, that, Lord, you are at work. God, that you have revealed in your word that there are two different kinds of people in this world. And that, Lord, you draw people who are made of flesh and you give them life and make them people who are of the Spirit. Lord, I ask that you would stir hearts and change minds today. In Jesus' name.